What's the word, y'all? We back with some more uh, reacting to Bleach Report's lists. Um, eventually, like I said, we will get back to doing highlights, but I want to go through this entire series. We've done point guards and shooting guards. If you have not seen those, go back a video or two. Uh, but now we're here at Small Forwards. Um, based on this season is the way this works. So we're forgetting resumes and everything just based on the, the sample size that we have for the 2019-2020 seasons. This is who Andy Bailey and Dan Favell believes are the top 15 small forwards. Throughout the first couple episodes, I've agreed with some stuff. I've disagreed with a lot of stuff. But it's all in the sake of entertainment, right? That's what sports is about. Now, some of y'all were wild on yesterday's video because uh, Chris Middleton wasn't listed as a top 25 or top 15 shooting guard, which obviously means that Chris Middleton is not a shooting guard, so he should be on this list. You know what I'm saying? If somebody is blatantly, like he was an all-star this year, how can he not be at this position? Then that means he's got to be at another position, all right? So he should be here in small forwards. Um, and I'm curious what they do up top here with Kawhi and LeBron. And I'm guessing that Giannis is technically a power forward. Okay? Anyway, let's get to the top 15 right here. Starting off with TJ Warren, Duncan Robinson at 14, OG Adenobi, Kelly Oubre, and Joe Ingles. Interesting stuff here. Okay. Um, there's one player that I wish was, was in this, and that's Will Barton. Um, I think Will Barton's great and very underrated, but I, I expected him to be in this range, but he's not. So that's, that's kind of trash. Uh, TJ Warren. I think TJ Warren is also underrated. 20, uh, 15 seems kind of low. It has to be something about his defense. Um, he leaves plenty to desire on the defensive side. Yes, it's about his defense not being good. But uh, he's one of those few players in NBA history that went from being unable to hit a three to being pretty nice at the three-point shot. TJ Warren. That's what offseason work does, baby. And he, he hits a lot of them nowadays. Duncan Robinson. Basically, I'm going to say Duncan Robinson came into the league here because I know he's officially a part of a couple rosters before this. But this is the first real taste of Pat Paul's Duncan Robinson we've ever had in his career. So I am gonna I, I know he's not technically a rookie, but this is the first year that the world has known the name Duncan Robinson. And uh, yesterday I was live streaming and we were talking about players that a high percentage of their shots are assisted on. It, it kind of stemmed from seeing Martian Gortai get spoon-fed from John Wall, and we determined that like 95% of Duncan Robinson's point this season have been assisted on, which means that he's just coming off screens, catching the shooting, coming off screen, catching the shooting. His job is not to create his own shot, and he is elite at that catching and shooting. It says Steph Curry and Steve Novak are the only players in league history who have matched or exceeded Duncan Robinson's 2019-2020 marks for value uh 10.2 attempts per 75 possessions and efficiency at 44.8 that is ridiculous for the amount of shots that he's hit so shout out to duncan robinson um even if he doesn't dish out a ton of dimes or lock down the opposition's best player the impact is driven from shooting and i believe that duncan robinson is not a bad defender either you know what i'm saying like some players may not be good but they give the effort and he he's he's a high iq defender as well so i don't think he's a bad defender either he just ain't very good. Then we have OG Ananobi, which is great to see because once uh, Kawhi Leonard left the team, you knew that you needed somebody to take those defensive assignments, and we knew it was going to have to be OG. We were just waiting to see if he can actually do that thing, and he has been. Um, OG Ananobi, the secret weapon of the Toronto Raptors because he wasn't really playing once they went on that championship run. He was injured. Um, Toronto ranks in the 84th percentile when he's on the floor defensively. All you need to know, his defense is elite. He knocks down the shots uh, 38% from three on 3.4 attempts. Amazing. Kelly Oubre. Unironically, I know we make a lot of memes here on my channels about Kelly Oubre, but I legitimately enjoy watching Kelly Oubre play because in my mind, when I see him play, the only thing that matters to him is the win. You know what I'm saying? He tries to lock in when he, when he needs to. Um, he, he wears his heart on his sleeve and I love players like that. I think that he is still getting better and better and better every single season. So to see him 12th is pretty good for a 24-year-old rising player who's not looked at to be like the number one num or even number two option. This He's the prototypical 3 and D guy for uh, for the future of the Phoenix Suns. So we have Joe Wingles at 11. We talked to, talk about him a lot over here, but it's pick and roll with Rudy Gobert. I don't know if that was last season or this year. I'd be getting them mixed up. Was elite level, um, a good defender even in his 31, 32-year-old age. And he, he does everything well. So now we have Bogdanovich. Okay, so people always ask, like, uh, for for example, when we got to point guards, we saw Fred Van Vliet and Cal Lowry as point guards. And now we're seeing Bogdanovich and Joe Ingles as small forwards. How is that even possible? Um, 
but it is. I mean, let's be honest. Though Bogdanovich has played a lot of minutes at power forward this season, he is notoriously known playing small forward. And it's good to see him on his list. He has hit a couple big shots for them. I remember one specifically in the corner against the Bucks. He had another one at the top of the key or like the wing area, but I can't remember who he was going against. Um, again, a good defender. I remember a few years ago. I know this list is not about a few years ago, but it just comes to my mind that you remember that Pacers series with LeBron. He did a, a pretty good job guarding LeBron. Nobody's go, nobody's stopping LeBron, but he did a very good job just doing what he can to slow down LeBron in that series. Um, Bogdanovich is one of the six non-bigs averaging more than 20 points per game with a true shooting above 60%. I didn't know he was that efficient, but there he is. Uh, with Giannis, Devin Booker, James Harden, Dame, and Chris Middleton. That is a great class of players to be in with. Shout out to Bogdanovich. Oh, there's Will Barton. Let's go. Like, I, bro, I really believe that Will Barton is one of the most underrated players. But now he's at number nine. So maybe he's not underrated. Maybe he's underrated to, like, the general NBA fan. But I love watching Will Barton hoop, bro. I, I want to see what he says. Well, they say because it's two people. Kitchen Sig Metrics. Love, love. L loving Will Barton season. He grades out of a French top 50 player when looking at his average rank across six catch-alls. I don't even know what that means. That clearly overestimates his impact, but it also isn't flat-out egregious. Yes, y'all did go to college for a little bit, so I know that word. I know you're looking at it like, Kenny, I'm 12, and I know what that word is. Lineup composition accounts for more of Barton's advanced stats, yada, yada, yada. Uh, his fouls in check... An opponent have shot just 14 of 37 against him in isolation. That's what I'm talking about. Um, I just love that Will Barton, he's like, when I see Will Barton go to the paint, he's just the king of the acrobat. He refuses to get his shot blocked, and he going up and under, over. He doing everything to get the shot up, and he's, man, he's making him. Um, I really like Will Barton's game. I really, really like Will Barton's game. Barton contributes. I, I, I got to read this because this is in italics. Uh, Barton contributes at a considerable above average level across a wide variety of categories on both offense and defenses. And he's doing yada yada on the floor. Just know that he's a bucket. And when he's on the floor, the Denver Nuggets are a lot better. But him at nine is so surprising to me, but it makes me happy. It might be just a tad bit too, too high, if we're being honest. But it still makes me happy that he is on this list. Number eight, DeMar DeRozan. Now, DeMar DeRozan is one of the rare cases where, like, we know that he is a good basketball player, but the advanced metrics hate DeMar DeRozan. Like, the team just seems so much better when he's off the floor, but we know he can get his buckets. Like, look at his percentages over the last couple of seasons. He's been kind of underrated in that in that uh, field. Um, so I understand him being at the list. Eight, I think eight makes sense. I think eight around there makes sense. Next player is Gordon Hayward. Okay. I did not expect to see Gordon Hayward this high on the list. I can agree that he should be top 15, but seven seems a bit high, doesn't it? And I know he's having like the most efficient season of his career, but it's also because he's not taking as many shots as he was in, in Utah. Uh, he plays his role very well. He's a good defender and everything. But seven does still feel pretty high, right? I can't be the only one that feels that way. Um... I, I, yeah, that seems, that seems pretty high. He shoot a remarkable 55% inside the arc, including, uh, 53% on pull-up two-pointers. He raised a 95 percentile of spot of possessions. Like, we know, like, again, we know he's good, but it feels like this is, uh, this is a bit high for me. But it is, Brandon Ingram at six seems kind of low. Oh, that's interesting. Brandon Ingram at six seems kind of low. Who's number five? Jason Tatum, oh, that's a conversation. I do. I would probably have Jason Tatum higher, too. I would probably have Jason Tatum higher. But that's not taken away from Brandon Ingram. Amazing season uh, this year. Uh, Blossom into an all-star caliber player. Um, he, him and Zion on the court together have looked nice, even though he's kind of taking a back seat. And it seems like he's cool with that. You know, I'm an, he's like, I'm an all-star this season, but I'm okay with letting Zion get this many shots because that ultimately can mean that we can be better and I can finally hit the playoffs. So Brandon Ingram... Um, being at six seems kind of low, but then you got Jason Tatum at five and I'm like, okay, six is, makes, makes sense. Uh, but Jason Tatum, man, I think you can't go wrong. If you like Brandon Ingram more than Jason Tatum, that's cool too. But personally, I would take Jason Tatum over Brandon Ingram. So that's why I'm cool with this. Especially when you take a look at like from January to the end to when the season got, uh, terminated or postponed or whatever. 
Jason Tatum was looking ridiculous, bro. He's looking ridiculous. So, yeah, Jason Tatum at five. At four, there's Chris Middleton. Cash money. Um, cash money. 50, 40, 90, basically. Basically. He's he's this close. He's got eight games in the bubble to get to 50, 40, 90. And I don't know if he's going to do it. But he's just got to keep up the efficiency. And he's got to hit a little bit more of his, his free throws, right? I think his free throws are what's holding him back right now at like an 89.2 percent or something crazy like that he's a good defender his defense hasn't been as as amazing as previous years but they don't really need him to be you know lock in every possession chris middleton because they have so so many great defenders around um but even then he's still a well above average defender it's just maybe not as great as it was two three years ago i really love chris middleton at the four spot at three Jimmy Butler. Hey, I know the statistics of Jimmy Butler don't look amazing. He has not been able to hit a jump shot this season, but his impact is there. Think about what the Miami Heat were before he signed to this organization. He fits like if there's any player that fits the culture of the Miami Heat, it is Jimmy Butler. So when he ended up there, I was like, match made in heaven. Boy was in the gym at three o'clock in the morning and practice started at like eight. I could I can't even match. Why why? I feel like that's a little excessive. But you get what I'm saying? That's the type of player Jimmy Butler is. And uh, it makes sense that he's three. Even though on paper, it may not seem like he is as good as he is. But there's a reason for that. Because he is the team leader. He is the closer for this team. And he is the culture. He is the culture. So, three. Three makes sense. I would put him over Chris Middleton, too. And two, they have Kawhi. And at one, there's LeBron James. I was interested to see what they would think. Because uh, I've seen a lot of rankings where Kawhi Leonard was one. And, and LeBron was number two. Like, hey, LeBron, you ain't the king of the league no more. But, brother, I'm still agreeing with LeBron being the number one, dog. It's, it's hard for me not to. I don't hate this list, man. Again, there are some things that I don't agree with. Like, uh, number seven being Gordon Hayward. And there are some things I really love. I mean, I, again, I love Will Barton, but this may be still a little bit too high. But there are some things I do agree with, and that's what it's all about. Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section. Leave a like on the video. Subscribe if you're new. I don't think I've said that, but it's, it's still like 50-50. 50% of the people that are watching these videos are subscribed, and 50% of the people that are watching these videos aren't. So let's, let's get that to like at least 60% subscribe, right? Love y'all. I'm out.